Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad Read by Joe Baker Danelli, a cruising yawl, swung to her anchor without a flutter of the sails and was at rest. The flood had made, the wind was nearly calm, and being bound down the river, the only thing for it was to come to and wait for the turn of the tide. The sea reach of the Thames stretched before us like the beginning of an interminable waterway. In the offing, the sea and the sky were welded together without a joint, and in the luminous space, the tan sails of the barges, drifting up with the tide, seemed to stand still in red clusters of canvas, sharply peaked with gleams of varnished spirits. A haze rested on the low shores that ran out to sea in vanishing flatness. The air was dark above Gravesend, and farther back still seemed condensed into a mournful gloom, brooding, motionless, over the biggest and the greatest town on earth. The director of companies was our captain and our host. We four affectionately watched his back as he stood in the bows, looking to seaward. On the whole river there was nothing that looked half so nautical. He resembled a pilot, which to a seaman is trustworthiness personified. It was difficult to realise his work was not out there in the luminous estuary, but behind him, within the brooding gloom. Between us there was, as I have already said somewhere, the bond of the sea. Besides holding our hearts together through long periods of separation, it had the effect of making us tolerant of each other's yarns and even convictions. The lawyer, the best of old fellows, had, because of his many years and many virtues, the only cushion on deck and was lying on the only rug. The accountant had brought out already a box of dominoes and was toying architecturally with the bones. Marlow sat cross-legged, right aft, leaning against the mizzenmast. He had sunken cheeks, a yellow complexion, a straight back, an ascetic aspect, and with his arms dropped, the palms of hands outwards resembled an idol. The director, satisfied the anchor had good hold, made his way aft and sat down among us. We exchanged a few words lazily. Afterwards there was silence on board the yacht. For some reason or other, we did not begin that game of dominoes. We felt meditative and fit for nothing but placid staring. The day was ending in a serenity of still and exquisite brilliance. The water shone pacifically. The sky without a speck was a benign immensity of unstained light. The very mist on the Essex marshes was like a gauzy and radiant fabric, hung from the wooded rises inland and draping the low shores in diaphanous folds. Only the gloom to the west brooding over the upper reaches became more sombre every minute, as if angered by the approach of the sun. And at last, in its curved and imperceptible fall, the sun sank low, and from glowing white changed to a dull red, without rays and without heat, as if about to go out suddenly, stricken to death by the touch of that gloom brooding over a crowd of men. Forthwith, a change came over the waters, and the serenity became less brilliant but more profound. The old river and its broad reach rested unruffled at the decline of day, after ages of good service done to the race that peopled its banks, spread out in the tranquil dignity of a waterway leading to the uttermost ends of the earth. 
We looked at the venerable stream, not in the vivid flush of a short day that comes and departs forever, but in the august light of abiding memories. And indeed, nothing is easier for a man who has, as the phrase goes, followed the sea with reverence and affection than to evoke the great spirit of the past upon the lower reaches of the Thames. The tidal current runs to and fro in its unceasing service, crowded with memories of men and ships it had borne to the rest of home or to the battles of the sea. It had known and served all the men of whom the nation is proud, from Sir Francis Drake to Sir John Franklin, knights all, titled and untitled, the great knights errant of the sea, it had borne all the ships whose names are like jewels flashing in the night of time, from the Golden Hind, returning with her round flanks full of treasure to be visited by the Queen's Highness and thus pass out of the gigantic tale, to the Erebus and Terror bound on other conquests and that never returned. It had known the ships and the men. They had sailed from Deptford from Greenwich, from Erith, the adventurers and the settlers, king's ships and the ships of men on change, captains, admirals, the dark interlopers of the eastern trade, and the commissioned generals of East India fleets. Hunters for gold or pursuers of fame, they all had gone out on that stream, bearing the sword and often the torch, messengers of the might within the land, bearers of a spark from the sacred fire. What greatness had not floated on the ebb of that river into the mystery of an unknown earth? The dreams of men, the seed of commonwealths, the germs of empires. The sun set, the dusk fell on the stream and lights began to appear along the shore. The Chapman Lighthouse, a three-legged thing erect on a mud flat, shone strongly. Lights of ships moved in the fairway, a great stir of lights going up and going down. And farther west, on the upper reaches, the place of the monstrous town was still marked ominously on the sky, a brooding gloom in sunshine, a lurid glare under the stars. And this also, said Marlow suddenly, has been one of the dark places of the earth. He was the only man of us who still followed the sea. The worst that could be said of him was that he did not represent his class. He was a seaman, but he was a wanderer too, while most seamen lead, if one may so express it, a sedentary life. Their minds are of the stay-at-home order, and their home is always with them, the ship, and so is their country, the sea. One ship is very much like another, and the sea is always the same in the immutability of their surroundings, the foreign shores, the foreign faces, the changing immensity of life, glide past veiled not by a sense of mystery, but by a slightly disdainful ignorance, for there is nothing mysterious to a seaman unless it be the sea itself, which is the mistress of his existence and as inscrutable as destiny. For the rest, after his hours of work, a casual stroll or a casual spree on shore suffices to unfold for him the secret of a whole continent, and generally he finds the secret not worth knowing. The yarns of seamen have a direct simplicity, the whole meaning of which lies within the shell of a cracked nut. But Marlowe was not typical, if his propensity to spin yarns be accepted, and to him the meaning of an episode was not inside like a kernel 
but outside, enveloping the tail which brought it out only as a glow brings out a haze, in the likeness of one of those misty halos that is sometimes made visible by the spectral illumination of moonshine. His remark did not seem at all surprising. It was just like Marlowe. It was accepted in silence. No one took the trouble to grunt even. And presently he said, very slow, I was thinking of very old times when the Romans first came here, 1900 years ago, the other day. Light came out of this river since. You say nights? Yes, but it is like a running blaze on the plain, like a flash of lightning in the clouds. We live in the flicker. May it last as long as the old earth keep rolling, but darkness was here yesterday. Imagine the feelings of a commander of a fine, what do you call them? Trireme? In the Mediterranean ordered suddenly to the north, run over land across the Gauls in a hurry, put in charge of one of those craft, the legionaries, wonderful lot of handy men they must have been, used to build apparently by the hundred in a month or two, if we may believe what we read. Imagine him here, the very end of the world, a sea the colour of lead, a sky the colour of smoke, a kind of ship about as rigid as a concertina and going up this river with stores or orders or what you like. Sandbanks, marshes, forests, savages, precious little to eat fit for a civilised man. Nothing but Thames water to drink, no Falernian wine here, no going ashore. Here and there a military camp lost in a wilderness, like a needle in a bundle of hay. Cold, fog, tempests, disease, exile and death. Death skulking in the air, in the water, in the bush. They must have been dying like flies here. Oh yes, he did it. Did it very well too, no doubt, but without thinking much about it either, except afterwards the brag of what he had done through his time, perhaps. They were men enough to face the darkness. And perhaps he was cheered by keeping an eye on the chance of promotion to the fleet at Ravenna by and by, if he had good friends in Rome and survived the awful climate. Or think of a decent young citizen in a toga. Perhaps too much dice, you know. Coming out here in the train of some prefect, or tax gatherer, or trader even, to mend his fortunes. Land in a swamp, march through the woods, and in some inland post, feel the savagery, the utter savagery, are closed around him. All that mysterious life of the wilderness that stirs in the forest, in the jungles, in the hearts of wild men. There's no initiation either to such mysteries. He has to live in the midst of the incomprehensible, which is also detestable. And it has a fascination too that goes to work upon him. The fascination of the abomination. You know, imagine the growing regrets, the longing to escape, the powerless disgust, the surrender, the hate. He paused. Mind, he began again, lifting one arm from the elbow, the palm of the hand outward, so that with his legs folded before him, he had the pose of a Buddha preaching in European clothes and without a lotus flower. Mind, none of us would feel exactly like this. 
What saves us is efficiency, the devotion to efficiency. But these chaps were not much account, really. They were no colonists. Their administration was merely a squeeze and nothing more, I suspect. They were conquerors, and for that you want only brute force, nothing to boast of when you have it, since your strength is just an accident arising from the weakness of others. They grabbed what they could get for the sake of what was to be got. It was just robbery with violence, aggravated murder on a great scale, and men going at it blind, as is very proper for those who tackle a darkness. The conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking of it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. What redeems it is the idea only, an idea at the back of it, not a sentimental pretense, but an idea, and an unselfish belief in that idea, something you can set up and bow down before and offer a sacrifice to. He broke off. Flames glided in the river, small green flames, red flames, white flames, pursuing, overtaking, joining, crossing each other, then separating slowly or hastily. The traffic of the great city went on in the deepening night upon the sleepless river. We looked on, waiting patiently. There was nothing else to do till the end of the flood. But it was only after a long silence when he said in a hesitating voice, I suppose you fellas remember I did once turn freshwater sailor for a bit, that we knew we were fated before the ebb began to run to hear about one of Marlowe's inconclusive experiences.